Unfortunately, that's yeah. the way it is, and Just want to let everybody know if you can hear me on Zoom, we're waiting on a projector screen to show up here, so we'll get started once that shows up. Oh, power, that's always the important first part. Oh, I'm still here. Well, that's good.
That's cool. Take the power like that. Yeah. 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 Not detect. Push more back. Hmm. This down is about as far as I can go. That's a little. Hey, boy. 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 Hey, it's a fire. Yes. 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 But I, I hear somebody talking and saying my name, and that worries me. <laughs> All right. Let's do it this way. Explain. No. No. Yeah, I'm going to go to the 
There was nobody driving up the driveway to the car. What's that? There was nobody driving up the driveway. <laughs> I see four new faces. All right. Well, I guess we may as well get started then. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. I'm Roy Gott. I'm the uh, one of the co-chairs along with Bob Bastinto here. Mike Summer is also on the committee. Tom Toll and is Ryan. Mark Perka, okay, sorry. Two new people, I had to flip the coin. Mark Perka, also recently on the committee. Uh, if you've got the food, please help yourself to extras when you leave, if you'd like. Uh, there is a bathroom up the hall and to the right that is not blocked off if you need one. And if you have any questions anywhere along the way, uh, I know the, the screen isn't perfect because of the amount of light we got in here, but uh, I'll have this slide deck available online. If you sign in, I'll send out some information afterwards so everybody can get, get that if they want to look through the slides themselves but we'll go over pretty much everything that's on here. Um, so real quickly about the committee, we formed in the beginning of last year. Uh, it was a joint committee representing member with members representing both Goolsboro and Winter Harbor. Uh, we looked at it as a peninsula-wide project because geographically it doesn't make sense not to. Uh, if we wanted to do something in Winter Harbor, we have to go through Goolsboro. And if we just do Goolsboro, What's the point of leaving out Winter Harbor? So uh, real quickly, what is broadband? It is high-speed internet access, but it's not a specific type of internet service. It's measured by download and upload speeds. Download speeds are what are most important for things like streaming movies and TV shows, surfing the web, uh, receiving large files. Upload speeds are more important when you are doing any sort of video conferencing or any anything where you're sending information as much as you're receiving. So when we were doing remote learning, when people are doing telehealth and people are working from home, those sorts of things, upload speeds are important for. Maine has a standard for what is broadband of 100 megabits per second down and 20 megabits per second up. That's actually a pretty low standard but that's what the state calls broadband. Uh, just some examples of what you might do with these different speeds. If you just have one megabit per second, you can browse the web, do social media like Facebook, check email, stream online radio, make, uh, if you have a, a phone that works over your internet connection, a VOIP phone, you can make calls like that, or you could Skype with somebody but you wouldn't want to do all those at the same time because you would quickly run out of bandwidth. If you move up to five megabits, you can do some of those things simultaneously. You could also stream standard definition television, and you can do some, some basic online gaming. Between five and 25 megabits, you can do more uh, reliable work from home, remote learning, uh, and just more complex teleconferencing. You can stream higher quality video. Sort of the, the most demanding application would be Netflix, for example, and 4K super high definition, that takes 25 megabits to do on a TV. So if you want the, the highest quality streaming, you have to go with that at least 25 megabits, and that's download. And every single person, uh, every single device that's connected to your home internet 
uses up some of that bandwidth. So if you have five megabits and you've got three people at home, they're all competing uh, for that five megabits and taking up chunks of it themselves. Broadband, uh, internet in general, but broadband works over uh, multiple formats. So it could be fiber, it could be cable, you could have satellite like Starlink, or you could have a cellular provider using a hotspot uh, that runs off of the, the cell towers. In the case of uh, most of those, the internet access comes in through a, a physical connection from a utility pole, or you would have a satellite dish uh, that's mounted somewhere outside on your roof that comes inside. Once inside the building, your internet goes through a number of other devices, potentially uh, a router or a modem, sometimes a combination. You might have something that does wireless in your home. So you have all those pieces that your computer and devices connect to the internet through. And many factors impact the speed that you're able to use because like a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, your connection to the internet is only as fast as the slowest piece that you connect through along the way. So again, the Peninsula, the Skudik Peninsula Broadband Committee formed in 2022. Um, <clears throat> our goal is to ensure that all residents and businesses in both towns have a reliable, affordable broadband internet connection. Why is broadband important to these communities? First, it's a driver of economic growth. You might have, uh, you might be able to attract people to come and work in the area if, if that's what you're hoping to do. Uh, if there's a better connection available, many people look for uh, a good, reliable, high-speed connection when they're, they're looking for a place to move. But beyond just attracting people to the area, many of the young people who might otherwise look out of state for employment because what they want to do, maybe it involves some remote capacity or needs internet access that's, that's high capacity. If they have to go out of state, they're not sticking around. If they have a good broadband internet connection here, we give them the opportunity, we give them the choice to be able to stay and do that work here and continue to be a part of our communities. Remote learning, hopefully we never have to go back to remote learning like we did during the pandemic, but uh, there are things that you can do remotely with tutoring and other sorts of uh, supports that are not just strict remote learning that are feasible when you have a good robust internet connection. Telehealth is also becoming more important as time goes on. Uh, we all know it's difficult to get into a doctor's office and get actual face-to-face -face interaction with the doctor. More people are turning to telehealth options and to be able to do that, you need to have that high-speed connection that works in both directions. And as always, you, know, you need it for all the internet-related things that you already might do or want to do, uh, just to keep in touch with your family, friends, and neighbors. So to inform our work, we sent out two rounds of uh, surveys, one in Gouldsboro, one in Winter Harbor. And between the two, we ended up with 138 responses last year. Of that 138, 128 said they had internet access of some kind and 10 did not. Of the 10 respondents who didn't have internet access, they all wanted internet access. And just some example, these are the, the things that's kind of hard to see up there, but. 60 of the respondents had DSL from Consolidated Communications, 41 had cable through Spectrum, 11 had satellite internet of some kind, whether that was HughesNet, Wild Blue, Starlink, one of the, the satellite providers. Eight used mobile hotspots from either AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, or some other cellular provider, and 17 didn't respond to what type of internet they had. The advertised speeds that these respondents reported were between, I just wanna move this over here so I can see because it's easier, between 0.76 megabits down and 0.76 megabits per second up, uh, and as high as 500 megabits down and 300 megabits up. That's what the company that they're paying the, uh, for the service that's what they're telling them they should be receiving, anywhere between those numbers. The actual speed uh, results that they reported were anywhere from half a megabit down uh, and 0.09 megabits up, 
to 359 megabits down and 980 megabits up. So a few of them were getting better than the speed that they were advertised, but the vast majority were getting speeds well below what they were paying for. While some services reported very good speeds, only 19 respondents reported download speeds that met the 100 megabit per second download threshold. And only eight met the 20 megabit per second upload threshold. So the vast majority of people who responded are not getting speeds that match the state's definition of what broadband is. <clears throat> As far as pricing, some respondents paying uh, re reported paying as little as $6 a month and as much as $330 a month. The median price was $62 per month. The average price was $70.50. And I will say, sometimes it's not possible to really tell what your internet, uh, what the portion of your bill represents internet, because if you bundle internet with phone, for example, it might not be itemized, but that was based on people's best guesses in those cases. So as far as what people are doing with the broadband or their internet that they do have, 123 responded email, 120 were doing it for web browsing, 99 said streaming, 88 social media, 63 work from home, 48 were already using telehealth, 42 for their business or home office, 36 for remote learning, 30 for home surveillance, and 28 for smart home. So if you have a thermostat that is connected to the internet that you can control remotely, that sort of a thing. Half of the respondents said that their internet service was inadequate for their current needs. And of those for whom service was inadequate, 51 said that the obstacle to better service was that it wasn't available. And 11 said that improved service would be too expensive. So with that information, the committee set a goal of having a symmetrical connection, meaning that's the same speed going download as upload. And the threshold that we want to see the minimum is 100 megabits. So 100 megabits down, 100 megabits up. The symmetrical connection, uh, again, that's meaning that the upload and the download are, are the same amount. And we also looked at different modes of getting that to the customers and we decided that a fiber solution, so using fiber optic cable instead of copper based, is the best option for future upgradability and capacity. The reason we feel that it's important to have a symmetrical connection is um, basically, the, the direction we're going with more interactivity, the remote learning, the teleconferencing, the work from home, the telehealth, that's necessitating that symmetrical connection. Historically, most of the internet, uh, most of the commercial history of the internet, you've gone to a website or, and you've downloaded a lot more information than you uploaded in the process. When you're streaming, it's a lot of information coming to you. There's not very much going back out. So historically, having that asymmetrical connection was very feasible, and uh, it, it was what most people needed. But as the needs change, having that symmetrical connection becomes more important. Uh, DSL cable and satellite-based providers are all predominantly <coughs> asymmetrical connections. The Really, the only one that comes close to having some sort of symmetry is Starlink, which is different from the other satellite providers. Uh, but fiber is the, the prime example of a symmetrical internet connection. Fiber optic cables are already the methods used to create the backbone of the internet as a whole. Uh, they carry the most bandwidth with the least degradation over the greatest distance. And for local uses, fiber has become a lot more uh, affordable than it was in the past. It's lightweight it, it imposes less burden on the poles themselves. And there's no no real known limit to what the capacity of the fiber optic cable is at this point. The technology keeps improving on either end and that allows them to keep increasing the bandwidth that a single fiber can carry. So there's no limit in sight per se for what a single fiber could carry. Uh, 
the drawbacks to fiber are similar to the drawbacks that you have for any other cable that's going to be up on a pole. It's subject to damage when a pole gets hit, a tree falls, you know, the fiber breaks, you have to splice it before you can go back to using it. But again, that's no different than you would experience if you have a copper-based network. Um, fiber is uniquely not susceptible to corrosion the way that copper networks are. So uh, there are certainly advantages to going with fiber over copper. So we have a couple different options. If we want to expand service, we can either engage with an internet service provider to build and operate a fiber network across the two towns, or we could build a municipally owned and operated fiber network and handle it internally. Uh, alternatively, yes, there is the third option that we could always just let the internet providers do what they have always done and expand on their own schedule. Um, that doesn't usually work out well for us in the end. We're usually waiting quite a while for that. Bob. I was going to ask if there are any questions. Yeah, sometimes we, you know, we've been in the business a long time, so for us it's second nature, but yeah. you know, some folks, it's like, mm -hmm. well, what's a megabit? What's, what's, yeah. what's a bit? And yeah. One of the things that's really important to understand is that cable TV is not the internet. Okay, it's a separate, separate entity. It goes over the internet or it goes over the feed, but you don't need, once you have high speed internet, you can cut your cable, cut the cable out and stream it. Yeah. Which is what a lot of people are doing. So, yeah. From, yeah. From, yeah. No, no, the question that we have is, I don't know what your background is, but you're very impressive to me because I'm so big. But uh, my, my anytime anything like this comes up, I'm always wondering about the cost mm -hmm. because you know I, there's lots of things I want, but sure. maybe there's a cost too much I don't want. Yeah. So that, that, that's the angle I'm most of it. And, yeah, and we'll focus a little bit more on costs later on, but just briefly. Um, for example, you know, people would ask, how does this compare with existing service, like Spectrum service? So if you're a new customer, obviously Spectrum will tend to give you a promotional price. For example, I signed up a few months ago for a 500 megabit down, and I think it's still something like 20 or 30 megabit up package from Spectrum. And I actually have phone built in with that, and it's $60 a month for that first year. So, and then it goes up by 20% in year two, and then whatever they feel like in year three and thereafter. You know how it works for seasonal people? And you cut it off and there's no expense. And then... it's, not a, it's not a contract, so you can certainly cancel it at any time. I don't know that they do seasonal shutdown or suspend. They, they actually do. Okay. You can do a seasonal suspend. I think they give you three months. So, okay. you know, maybe July or September, they're going to go back. But you can suspend service for three, about three months. And that's a reduced rate? Uh, yeah, it's like, I'm going to throw it out there. There's no, don't quote me on this, but it could be like $15 a month. Okay. I mean, we're on fixed income. And you folks, I guess, are on fixed income. We're all taking Social Security. So, we got to watch every penny. But, uh, now, recently, we just cut the cord mm -hmm. on cable TV, and it's getting ridiculous. So yeah. you're comparing what you want, and then mm -hmm. yeah. compare to these other apps, Spectrum mm -hmm. and the TV cable and the what yeah. Which of these other outfits are the best? So that's a, a little bit of a subjective question, but uh, so there are guidelines in terms of reliability. <clears throat> excuse me, and service level payments, otherwise known as SLAs, that Spectrum likes to publish on fiber, that they're 99, they give you three nines of reliability. <clears throat> it's not to say that you have a lightning strike takes a pole down, or a uh, uh, tree goes into the pole and takes the line down. You know, there's nothing you can do about that. That's like an act of God. However, what they try to do is guarantee response time or main time to repair. So if something goes down, I mean, at two o'clock in the morning, something, you know, the pole goes down, they're not going to get to it until later on in the day. If they, you know. 
So I would I would add to that that a physical connection is always going to be less susceptible than a wireless connection of any sort. So when you're looking at satellite providers or cellular providers, which go either to a satellite dish at some, some distance in orbit or to a cell tower, those connections will be more susceptible to interference than anything that comes over a physical table. So there's that consideration. As far as uh, the terrestrial solutions that run off of the, the utility poles, cable through spectrum can offer very good download speeds. <clears throat> like I said, I'm, I'm getting 500 megabits down right now. Uh, DSL, if you have the absolute best DSL that Consolidated offers in this area, you're probably gonna get about 80 megabits down which doesn't sound that good compared to 500. But the question is, what are you doing with that connection? If your need is for 25, then a 500 megabit connection is gonna do no better for you than an 80 megabit connection. Mm -hmm. So barring any sort of damage to the network like Bob reference, both of those connections, if they're working the way they're advertised, and I, to my experience, while DSL isn't as fast as consolid as uh, Spectrum's cable can be, when it's running and it does run perfectly as advertised most of the time, at what I've seen, you wouldn't notice a difference between them. Uh, fiber would be similar. You have that same terrestrial base. The connection that fiber can offer goes up to 10 gigabits per second or 10,000 megabits per second. So that's that's the connection that would be potentially available on a fiber network as compared to DSL or Spectrum's cable. So quality does not mean speed, but certainly if you don't have enough speed, you can't do what you need to do in a quality way. Um, outside of that, you know, cable and DSL do tend to both be sort of shared networks so that the more people you get in uh, using it, sometimes you will notice speed degradation there. Uh, a lot of that depends on the back end, how, how the, uh, the internet provider is organized. I, I suppose you could, you could probably get, uh, if you oversell your fiber service, you could probably get to the point where you, you're having that problem as well. But generally speaking, fiber is usually advertised as a much more constant you have this amount of bandwidth and that's you're pretty reasonably assured that you're going to get that when we have uh, mm -hmm. had it for years yep i don't know where it fits in the fiber dsl i don't even know what dsl stands for fair point is dsl is dsl what is dsl yeah. Digital yeah. subscriber line. And it comes over a wire. It comes over your telephone cable. Yeah. We don't have a phone, but we right. still have the internet. Yep. Yeah. Uh, DSL works at a different, basically a, a different wavelength in the, the spec and the on the cable than voice would. And so, so you know, if your spectrum is a coaxial cable, I don't, what is it on the poles? It's hybrid fiber in some cases. <clears throat> Well, they've gone to hybrid fiber, but it's still by large as Yeah, it's a it's a larger, you know, larger gauge, thicker cable that can carry more more information. Mm -hmm. it, it's wire uh, originally designed to carry television, but has been expanded to carry data uh, as well. What is fiber? Fiber is a thin glass uh, strand that carries pulses of light. So it's not electrical. It's a. It's, actually, you probably have seen it. You know, if you go to like the Christmas tree shops, they'll have like those displays of like flowers, and they have a revolving light. Yeah, that is actually yeah. fiber. Yeah. Actually, that's how they test fiber initially. Mm -hmm. They'll put a flashlight on yeah. to see if there's any breakage in it, and if you see light at the other end, the continuity is good. Yeah. On that, is there a difference in? Um, to damage between. Maybe. Tree falls on it. Tree falls on, tree it. falls on it. It's going to do the same kind of damage to a fiber as it would to uh, to a cable made of copper. So, um, what kind of infrastructure 
are you looking at with this proposal? Basically, uh, depending on the route we we're going, if we're talking about building a fiber network, it would be running fiber along the utility poles, mimicking where the existing copper cables already are to be able to reach every address. Not 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 electromagnetically. Uh, I suppose if you could have some inadvertent physical interference, if somebody's up there on the pole and they're adjusting, there's always the chance they might do something that that interferes. But yeah. but again, nothing unique to fiber versus any other solution. So we have we have DSL here, mm -hmm. and the house in Florida has. 5G fiber with AT&T. Mm -hmm. I can't tell the difference. So if you're, what would you say your typical daily use is? I just use it to check emails, to mm -hmm. read the news, yep. pay the bill. So those are all I'm pretty. Conferences right yeah. Now. Those or are. That, like, play. Yeah. Those are pretty low main. Those are low bandwidth activities. Uh, there's not a lot of data that has to get from the internet to your computer and back to make those things happen. Uh, so in your case, it doesn't seem like bandwidth would be the concern. You, you obviously have, if you're not noticing a difference between fiber in Florida and DSL here, you're not reaching the limits of your DSL. Um, but you say you just use it for internet. You don't have a landline phone, correct? I do not have a landline phone. Okay. No, our kids call it. Mm -hmm. What do you know what you're paying for your, your DSL? Uh, it's about $55 a month. 55 Okay. Well, yeah. So not too I'm paying, I think, 78 for the uh, fiber. Yep. Well, and that's the, the thing is it doesn't just because fiber is actually a superior connection doesn't mean that the internet access costs a lot more either. So yeah. Uh, we'll look at some some uh, examples. To do streaming on your TV, the fire state. You would want to have, I would say, at least twenty five megabit uh, internet connection. And where, uh, what town do you live in? Prospect. Okay, in Prospect Harbor, and reasonably close to the town office. Um, we're out on the end of Lighthouse Point. Okay, so I don't. You're not in the worst place for DSL in Prospect Harbor, but you're certainly not right next to the yes, DSL. Sensitive DSL, right. so. DSL only works three miles out from the central office, wherever it is that Consolidated has its building. Yeah, and so it only works three wire run miles. So if you follow that cable all the way from their office to your house, you can only go three miles with DSL. And the further you go, the lower the quality of the service is going to be that they can offer uh, because the service over copper degrades uh, in that way, or at least the copper that they've employed. So you would probably, I would wager a guess that you are not on bonded DSL. You just got the regular garden variety, which Seven or 15 is the top that that can do. Yeah, well, depending on which flavor, HDSL as opposed to yeah. other flavors. Seven to 15 is about yeah. the max that they would be able to offer you, depending if you were right next to that office, probably. I think I've so. looked it up on you know, whatever you mm -hmm. look at. It said three. Okay, so three. You would not really be able to do streaming in any sort of reliable fashion with three. So you would want to see, like I said, if you can get in the 20 or 25 neighborhood, that would give you the ability to stream a Fire Stick, a Roku, any of those types of devices. Um, DSL isn't going to be able to offer you that where, where you are. If, if you're getting three, that's probably the most that you can get there. Uh, if they could offer you more, you would probably be paying another $10, $20 per month. So... Yeah, about spectrum. spectrum introductory package like i said new customer new customer if if they can offer you 500 they'll offer you 500 which would do the job which would certainly do the job 
the question is, do they have spectrum where your house is? It's there. Okay. So then in your case, that's a, if it's available now, that would be something that would be worth looking into if you want to do streaming and you're not. Like yeah. Otherwise, uh, you don't, still get turned on. Do you get, do you use your email address through, is your email address at myfairpoint.net? Yes. So that's the other thing that you want to consider is if you close your consolidated service, you would lose that email address. Yeah, yep. So that's a good term exchange of address. Yeah. Um, but that would be something that would be worth considering if if you would like to get streaming. Certainly, obviously, we don't have this going right now, but in the interim, if if it becomes more valuable to be able to do streaming than it is to hold on to your existing Fairpoint email address, that would be a good that would be a good improvement in service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when do you ask them? Goldsboro and Winter Harbor voters have to be approving a couple different stages of this. So I'll just, I'll run through this a little bit further here. Uh, like I said, there's two basic options. We can work with an internet service provider to build, uh, design, build, and operate the network. So with consolidated with their Fidium brand, for example, with Spectrum, if, if Spectrum were interested, to build out the network, and then they'd be the internet provider. That puts all the work on them for the most part. The, the communities would still be responsible for figuring out grant funding to make this uh, project feasible. So because if, it, if they wanted to build out the network, they would do it already but there's no payback for them to do so. So what's making it attractive for these internet providers to work with us now is there's grant money available so they can get a quicker return on the investment. Uh, the communities would have to borrow potentially for whatever the uh, whatever cost is not grant covered to get that to happen. While they might pay back the loans with what uh, service that the internet provider would uh, sell to customers, they would contribute to paying back the loans. Ultimately, it becomes their network and their responsibility to maintain, improve, and expand over time as they see fit. We lose any control over it if we uh, go the ISP route. And also that $55 a month that you're paying to uh, consolidated right now or the 60 that I'm paying to Spectrum, that money goes out and we hope that someday some of that comes back in the form of investment in the network, but there's no guarantee of that. Uh, just so you know, in 2022, late in the year, we sent out a, a request for information to existing internet providers to see who would be interested in working with us to build a network in the communities. Uh, we got two answers. One was from Consolidate, Consolidated Communications, your, so your fair point. They're trying to build out their Fidium network across a number of communities. I think they're doing in Ellsworth, and they did completely uh, install in Eastbrook and a number of other communities. I think Blue Hill Peninsula also got uh, some Fidium. And what? Fidium, that's the that's the brand that they're calling their fiber service. It's consolidated communications, but they're branding it as Fidium. Yeah. And so the other respondent was Axiom Technologies. They're based down east and uh, they build and operate fiber networks for municipalities all around, including recently Hamden. Their, their proposals, um, just quickly, they, they offered a range of possibilities. There's the straight ISP route, which they would build and operate. Uh, there was also, they would build and turn over the network to us with uh, uh, like a 20 year exclusivity agreement. There were some variation between the two, but they, they proposed a variety of responses. Uh, the other route is the municipally owned and operated route, which I discussed at the uh, select board meeting uh, a couple of weeks back. This is more complicated, but it gives us local control over the system. So we would still work with somebody, potentially an ISP, to design and build the network. 
uh, or it could be some other company that just literally builds networks for, uh, for companies or municipalities. The towns together, uh, either as a pair or if we wanted to get involved, which we do want to invite other communities to join in on this effort over time, uh, are responsible for operating, maintaining, and improving the network. We're still responsible for finding the funding for it, whether it be grants, whether it be borrowing, whatever the case may be. But in the long run, those customers that are signed up over that network, some of that money that goes back to the towns to pay off the debt, uh, when you paid off the loans, that money still keeps coming and that's revenue to the towns. Well, who sends the rates? The rates are set by the internet providers. And that's, there are lots of different pieces that go together to make this whole package. So that's something that we're going to talk about now. The example of this is Down East Broadband Utility. They're based out of Callis and Baileyville. Those were the two towns that started it. Uh, they built a dark fiber open access network. So pulling that apart. Dark fiber means they're just the fiber on the, on the poles. They don't provide the service. They're just the fiber that's there. Uh, they work with an internet service provider to light the fiber, to provide service over those fibers on the poles. Uh, open access, meaning that there can be multiple internet service providers that compete to provide that service. Uh, as we know, competition is always healthy. <laughs> To the extent that capacity is available. To the extent that capacity is available, yeah. Uh, in their network, every customer that they ran to has a basically a direct line back to their central office. So you're only going to have one line to each address, basically. But any internet provider could serve anybody who has that uh, that service capability in that in those towns. Um, so once they put this fiber in, mm -hmm. people who are using it could switch from one ISP who is participating. Absolutely. To they want. Yep. To date, they've only got, I think, one on there. They were negotiating with other internet service providers to join in and to offer service. Uh, but to date, they've had the Pioneer Broadband, which is the company that actually built their network, Pioneer. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're a main based company. I think they're based actually Northern Maine a little bit, but they've got a uh, network all throughout the, the Eastern side of the state. So um, they actually build this? They built the network, they designed it, they built it for Down East Broadband, and they also maintain the network. If there's any trees that fall, any pole breaks. And in fact, I think one of the only outages they had uh, that they mentioned was one of their, the board members for Down East Broadband Utility backed a tractor or something into a pole. Uh, so that was embarrassing, but yes. How long have they been in this? I've never heard of Pioneer before this came up. Down East Broadband started their project in 2018. And in 2019, they started serving customers. They've also added the towns of Alexander, Indian Township, Cooper and Princeton, and maybe, in, who was the other one? Did, did we find out more recent? No, there may be another town even more recently added to their, their group that they've actually expanded built fiber in those towns as well and are, are providing or providing the avenue for service in those communities. Where is Pioneer based? Where is it corporate office? I think it's somewhere up. Well, you're, gonna, you're gonna look it up for me, Sandy? Well. I think it, it's up in the, it's in the Rustic County, I think. Oh, I, I think it's like maybe Presque Isle area somewhere. They, they've got Holton and that whole swath and then down East Broadband, so they're, Eastern Eastern border, uh, but Sandy might be able to find it. So, so they put the wires on the pole. They built the wire across. Holton, thank you. So the, the fiber, I can't tell you what the fiber itself costs, but it is a, a rough estimate to say that it costs $75,000 per mile to build a fiber network. 
using existing poles. Using existing poles. Is there any charge by the owner of the pole for using the pole? There are licensing fees, Bob. Yeah, I mean, there's a, every hundred feet typically is a telephone pole. Mm -hmm. So the roof miles on that, that's negotiated with. Yeah, but is there, there's a fee when there, you go. There's, a, there's, there's no free base. Yeah. So there's a, a licensing fee to get permission to mount your, your fiber on the poles. But that would be part of the, the cost of building that network. Would that be part of the whole owner's rate structure? I mean, the electric companies are regulated by the PUC. Mm -hmm. The companies aren't. Right. Um, yeah, I don't think some are, some are not. This, this one here for the, the internet here is FCC government. Or the FCC control side. Yeah, but not the PUC. The yeah, the PUC does not. Except yeah. to regulate the people who own the poles. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And if they're yeah. collecting fees, that's part, it should be part of their ratio. Well, I'm not sure what that part of it is. I just know that the the estimate the seventy five thousand that's comprehensive for building that network. And I'm, is it a recurring fee to have it on there? Or is it just sort of a one time? Would you think? Uh, that I honestly don't know. I mean, it depends on how it's negotiated. Yeah. On that. I mean, some one of the uh, as an MRC monthly recurring charge. Yeah. Most of the poles in this area are. Um, it was asked before are owned by Amera. Would is that correct? Where it's the power utility? The electric company. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Correct. You look at the pole, you'll see yes, like three wires on, on the very top. Yeah. Uh, and then below you'll see like black fat cable that's coax, and then sometimes you'll see an orange cable that's fiber on that. So yeah. So yeah, well, yeah. and there are, you know, certainly you could go that route to marry it, but it's certainly much more expensive. Have you ever tried to plant a tree? <laughs> I have. I have. So, uh, let's see, where was I? So, in any case, back to the Down East Broadband, they built the network. They have an internet provider that serves customers over that network. And it can support multiple internet service providers. Um, and it may be possible, this is what we've been sort of working towards. We've, we've had a, a, a feeling that this might be the route that would be most advantageous to us going forward. Um, certainly, uh, a good number of the committee members felt that way. And the two other broadband outreach meetings that we had this summer in April and June, uh, it was pretty overwhelming sentiment that they thought this was a route to go. Uh, just to give you some pricing examples. So again, with Pioneer Broadband, they built and maintained the network. Their base package is 100 megabits symmetrical. So that's the target that we were shooting for. It is $60 a month. So presently they offer speeds up to one gigabit or a thousand megabits per second. Um, and they're moving to have that become uh, under a hundred dollars. It's like 140 last time I checked, they're moving to have that actually come down in price and have all their packages be less than a hundred dollars. And as I said, the fiber itself will support up to 10 gigabits per second. So whatever the fastest package they offer right now, increase that by a factor of 10 for what the, the fiber on the poles could actually do long-term. Uh, at least as we understand it today. As I said, there's no known limit to what fiber can do. And no matter what package Pioneer is selling to a customer, $25 a month of that amount is returned to Down East Broadband to pay for the operation of the network. They have a network operator. That's their one employee, employee per se. They contract or they have a local electrical contractor who maintains and uh, serves as their network operator. Uh, any sort of reserve that they want to keep for maintenance and expansion going forward, and then to pay back the loans that were taken out to build the network in the first place. 
So that $25 a month goes to uh, pay back all of those uh, components and that's per customer. And they have approximately a thousand customers right now. So they've got about $25,000 a month income that's going to maintain their network, provide for future expansion and pay back the loans to build their network. And again, once the loans are paid off, that $25 a month per customer does not go away. It continues coming in and it gets returned to the communities. So who pays Pioneer? The customers. Okay, so they're the... The, they're the internet service provider. The yeah. And they also do the physical when something breaks, they come and fix it. The network operator gives them a call, says we've got a free down over here. They go send their equipment over and they do the repair. So they're a long way away from Alexander. They're well, a long way, certainly a long way from here, which is why we're not feeling that while it may be possible for us to join Down East Broadband Utility, it wouldn't necessarily be Pioneer Broadband who's building our network and who's maintaining it and necessarily providing service, yeah. though it could be. Uh, they, they do have some networks that they've built and maintain in our area. They're not, they're not just strictly based out of Holton or, or Kaylee, uh, Callis and Baileyville. So they have a pretty broad reach. They're a pretty good sized company in that regard. And they're adding more technicians all the time. In fact, one of the things that they've run into with Down East Broadband is they have customers waiting to be signed up, but you know, Pioneer mm -hmm. has to be able to get to them to do it. So they, they have people lined up for service just waiting to get uh, added in. Um, so again, not the case that we would necessarily be working with Pioneer, but again, this is just the example. Are there other companies like Pioneer? Yes. Yep. Yeah. There are others in the state and uh, we're working on a RFP to get um, projects proposed to match our specifications. And it's gonna be going out to companies like Pioneer all in the area that might have an interest in uh, doing this sort of a work. Why are we spending, uh, you and all the why, why are we spending so much time going in? This is a big deal we're working with. How do you get involved? Uh, so <laughs> for myself, I'm the IT manager for Skudik Institute, and we're Skudik Institute, sort of an anchor <clears throat> institute, uh, anchor organization in the community. They wanted somebody to, uh, to be part of the, the broadband committee effort. So I got volunteered by my supervisor. And, uh, but I, I enjoy the work and I think it's important. And I've worked in these communities for a long time. And a number of people can attest to the fact that I, I do uh, IT work for the both town offices and many private customers in the area. So I have a long background of seeing people with their struggles with internet access in these communities. Sandy? Um, I'm the vice president of the City Area Chamber of Commerce, but I'm here for business and as well on this particular negative issue. Number one. Number two, I own my own business and my partner and I both work remotely today, talking with CDC and the men who are working for the time. I was bumped out of my duty twice trying to do the presentation. I don't know how much harder it is to make your harder. That to me is not successful. I've also been bumped out of telehealth meetings. So for me, it's, if we want economic development for the community, if we want your advantage and the building technology with you, and stay with you, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, my daughter's not coming to visit me because she can't work remotely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so I volunteer to bring that to the for me, it's important to tell the community you can even argue that the tax is so mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I mean, that's just an awful place to live. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, unless you've got a certain personality, you're going to want to live in New York City. You can live in this beautiful area here. Mm -hmm. Do your work and get paid to say. And COVID really made it very apparent where the limitations of the existing infrastructure were. From the real estate perspective, some of the that 
you're only appreciated if you have five mm -hmm. high school families available or another resident or can be five from the jail. It's just not having it available. It's not as buying the service, but it is subscribed to it. So it's many things. So, so, uh, yeah, and again, we talked about, you know, the origin of DBU 2018 started serving in 2019, added the other towns, Alexander, Indian Township, Cooper, Princeton, 2021, 22, and 22. So they've been growing and their model is stable and sustainable uh, in their, in their area. Uh, they are, you know, Callis and Baileyville combined are a bigger population than Goolsboro and Winter Harbor. So there is that. They, they had a bigger population to get started with. But they also didn't have grant funding available at the time. So that's an advantage that we do have now uh, that they didn't have then. So, uh, and as I. Uh, you have a history with grants and you, you can anticipate how much you're going to get. I don't specifically have a history with grants, but one thing that, uh, so the, the very next round of grant funding, which I suspect we're not gonna be able to take advantage of because the window closes for the application in September. Uh, but if we could make that, they have a definition for what is and is not grant eligible, which is that it is unserved or underserved. And that is, I think, anything under 25 over three. So 25 megabits down, three megabits up, I think is the threshold for this next grant round. So part of it is uh, we're working with some consultants from, uh, the consultant is Mission Broadband. They're working with the Main Connectivity Authority to help these local broadband efforts do the work. And they're gonna do some mapping that's going to, basically look at the data for who has what service available where, and that will show us which customers, which addresses would be grant eligible. And uh, there will also, whoever we select as a partner for this project through the RFP process will be responsible for helping us fill out and apply for the grant. So a lot of that work is going to be taken off of the plate of us locally because it's a process that these larger companies will have done a number of times. But it's really that that number of eligible customers for the grant. So, for example, uh, 25 megabits down, three megabits up for this current round. The next round, I think, goes up to 100 megabits down, 20 up. So the next round does not include as many people, but incidentally, I think both rounds really mean if, if you've got DSL service for the, most part, for the most part and nothing else, that you would be eligible. If you've got cable available, it might count as served in the, the upcoming grant round. Sandy? Just to add to the caveat of the grant round, we are in line for the grant round because we've had two years of already obtained grants through this process. We've got a connected reducer and the get ready grant that we have right now to put us in line with services and technical assistance from the internet to the authority as well as the So the training room is one of the aspects of the grant? Excuse me. No. So the grant gets written by the, for the most part, the grant gets written by the company that we choose to work with to build the project. They're going to be doing the actual grant application with us. Oh. But we have to get the data first. We have to get the proposal back from them. We have to select who we're going to work with or want to work with. And their proposal is going to show us, uh, while I said Mission Broadband is doing estimating uh, with mapping to show us what we think our number of eligible households would be. They're going to send out their engineers. They're going to gather their own data. They're going to come up with a proposal for the design of the network. And they're going to know exactly which places are eligible for the grant and which ones aren't. So, for example, this next grant round has a $700 per, uh, per eligible address match. So if we have 
a thousand addresses or households or whatever you want to, to call it, and half of them are eligible, so 500, we would be expected to pay for those 500, $700 each. And then the balance of the cost of serving those 500 would be covered by the grant. Now, anything that's not eligible for the grant, we would bear the full cost of building the network to support them. So that's the way the current round of grant funding uh, shapes up. The next round, which again has a higher threshold to meet for uh, eligibility, may work a little bit differently, but that's how the grant funding works right now. Um, so getting up to what would it cost here? So I, I mentioned this at the Gouldsboro town uh, at the selectmen's meeting. We have roughly 82 miles between Gouldsboro and Winter Harbor of network that would need to be built. Um, that 82 miles assumes the same basic terms that Pioneer has given to Down East Broadband Utility, which is that they will cover the first 15, uh, yeah, 1,500 feet from the utility line to the customer. So if you've got a 1,200 foot long driveway, they cover in the, the installation, which is free. They, they don't charge you. I think it was a free installation, whatever. Their installation is includes that first 1,500 feet, which is a good long distance for most people. It would cover most of the driveways, though there are some really long driveways that would exceed that. Anything beyond that would be uh, a matter of negotiation between the prospective customer and the internet service provider. So this, this number of 82 miles assumes the similar term that the first 1,500 feet are included. And when you use the estimate of $75,000 per mile construction cost, it gives you $6,150,000 approximate network build costs. That doesn't include any grant money that might be available. That's just plain cost of building the network. And then, of course, here we talk, um, I just talked about served or underserved or unserved addresses and the $700 match current round of funding. So, again, if we, if that $6 million represented a thousand customers and half of those customers are eligible for grants, then half of this build cost would be uh, run through that that math to figure out the grant funding, $700 that we would owe per customer, and then the balance would be grant funded. There may also be the possibility to get money from Hancock County commissioners to cover that $700 match. So if uh, we, once we get the proposals back and we know how many eligible uh, customers we have for the grant, we can ask for that amount uh, so that Maybe those eligible customers would be entirely paid for by some sort of grant money. And then we'd just be responsible for financing the remainder. And let's see, any existing? Yeah. But that financing then has to be able to be paid off by that money that is returned from the internet provider to us. That's the, that's the threshold we have to make. So we need to make sure that whatever we build is not going to create a tax burden on the communities. <laughs> that we're going to hit that take rate, uh, if not immediately, then very quickly so that we are the ones paying back the loans, not the communities. That's our goal throughout this whole process. Again, here, Hancock County commissioners may have funds to cover the match. Uh, the more grant money, obviously, so the more eligible addresses, the better it is for us because that's less that we have to directly finance ourselves. Uh, on the customer side, as we, we've talked a little bit, uh, we already talked about Pioneer's rate structure of you know, $60 a month for that 100 megabit service, and they're moving to $100 a month for their gigabit service. For example, just for comparison, Fidium, the consolidated communications fiber product, their promotional rate $70 a month for one gigabit service or a thousand megabit. That's for their first year. But then of course it, it goes up after that. Um, 
And this little piece of information is good for anybody at any time. If you meet the criteria for the Affordable Connectivity Program, it's a federal program, it will provide you a $30 a month credit for your internet bill for those eligible households. It doesn't matter what internet you use, it's something that's available. Is it just is it just age or is it, uh, do we know if it's, it's income. income related? It might be both. I know there are programs for both. That's something that's that works with Spectrum, it works with Consolidated, it works it would work with this. Um, income, it's probably based on a percentage above poverty level. I would expect most programs do work like that. But there are some that are, uh, I think, that are age-based as well. So that would, so I'm not sure it's this program explicitly, but those are some things that can help anybody at any time. And again, why not let the internet service providers do it themselves? Because we know there are people that need this service now and existing internet service providers don't see a sufficient return on investment in these communities to build it. Otherwise they would have built it already uh, for rural areas that were a low priority. And we have the grant money options available now that weren't available before. In fact, uh, I think it was just you know three or four weeks ago they announced another 230 some million dollars for broadband in the state of Maine. So that's what is gonna be funding these next rounds of grant funding that we would, um, if we can't make this next one that we would like to do, that we'll be going for these later ones. Uh, the grant money used to be able to go to the internet service providers directly, but one of the things that changed and the reason why we have these local broadband efforts working across the state is because they found that when the government just gave the internet providers money, the internet providers would do the minimum they could and claim they did the job. <clears throat> this way, they have to force the money through the communities and the communities set the terms with the internet providers. So if you can set this up financially, mm -hmm. so that the public is gonna vote on this, mm -hmm. They can see they're not going to have to pay a bunch of money. Why wouldn't anybody want to? I agree. <laughs> and it's it's really so the it, government's giving you something for nothing. You want to take it? You want to take it? The yeah, money. It's not much. It's like an increase our tax because the government doesn't have any money of its own. It all comes from the tax. Well, and. As, as the chair of the RSU 24 board and having recently just built a large uh, new building, my absolutely, there is no such thing as free money. But the money in the federal government's case, the money is already printed. It's gonna be given to somebody. I'd rather it be given to us. So that's, you know, I agree with you 100%, but if there's money available, it's better to take advantage of it locally than let it go to somebody else. I'll be greedy that way. I'll, I'll, I'll claim to be greedy. Uh, so yes, it's really about getting the RFPs done, getting them back in and evaluated, see what the projects look like, what the build cost is, what the eligibility for the grants is, so we can know what the financial impact would be so that we can present to the voters what the options are, how to do this, and be clear with the, the explanation that this is something that is designed to not increase your taxes because it should become very quickly self-sufficient and pay for itself. And I will speaking for myself, but it's a sentiment I've heard from the community members. Our goal is not to push a project uh, that has a likelihood that it's going to need taxpayer support. If it's going to be, you know, if it even looks like it's maybe leaning in that direction, then it's got to be something that the community has to vote and say, yes, we, we think that's an appropriate risk, but that will be a community vote. And all of that information will be there for the community to look at before we, we make that leap. What's your goal for the time? So we were hoping to, like I said, get into this uh, grant round that's in September closing, but I don't think we have the, the practical ability to do that. Uh, the RFP is being 
finalized now. So that will probably be going out at the beginning of next month. It will probably remain open for about six weeks. And then we'll have to evaluate the responses that we get. And then we will work on selecting a partner. At the same time, uh, of course, you remember at the meeting, I asked the, the select board to uh, look at moving forward with the interlocal agreement so that we could create a nonprofit that would pursue this project for both towns. I know uh, the word has come back from the Gouldsboro town office that Gouldsboro's lawyers recommend it go forward for a, uh, a vote, a special town meeting. And that will happen sometime late August or September. And I haven't heard yet from Winter Harbor what the status is, but I will be checking with them to find out. Um, so that's a that's something that we can do in parallel while these RFPs are out there and being evaluated. Once we have the answer back, uh, of course, it'll be too late for the current round of grant funding, but we can then start getting everything lined up for whenever the next round of grant funding comes along so that we can be ready to move forward with an application there. And we'll already know who's eligible for what based on the level of service at the various addresses we have. And it'll also give us a chance if we find that you know, we have a $6 million project cost and half of it is uh, half of it's going to be grant eligible and the other half we have to borrow and it doesn't look like we'll get the take rate that's necessary to pay for the loans to build the network, then it gives us time to refine the project and maybe try to prioritize areas that are exclusively going to be grant funded and get the, the biggest priorities out first. And then once the, the model is up and running and paying for itself to be able to go back and selectively add in other areas to expand and try and uh, get universal coverage across the two towns. Well, in the case of, again, going back to Downey's Broadband, the towns, uh, town of Baileyville and the city of Callis voted to back the loans. So it was actually those two municipalities that took out the loans because they they felt so strongly about this project. It doesn't mean that we would have to go that route, but as a if we do put together a nonprofit, it'll be a new entity. There won't be any sort of credit history for it. It might still make sense for the towns to either go uh, take out loans or bond for this project. Again, the money flows so the back. Would be the ones the They'd be the ones taking on the debt but we would be channeling the money back to them to pay those, those uh, make those payments. Uh, let's see. So yeah, next steps, RFP. Uh, I mentioned the earlier outreach meetings, everybody was in favor of going the municipally owned route. Nobody, I would say that nobody preferred to go with just the internet service provider building it, owning it, and running it for ever as themselves. Um, and I don't know, any thoughts from you folks about which route you'd like to see us go if you think we're on the right track? All right. There's certainly a lot to it. Uh, and I, I will just add as well, I, I touched on it before, but in the same way that Down East Broadband has added additional towns over time, in my mind, the ideal scenario is that we also would provide sort of that, that starting point for a larger area uh, network. Yes. Has this sort of um, proposal um, been done in other states? We haven't looked at other states. Uh, I mean, we know it's been done elsewhere in the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sure it's been done. I'm curious about people's experience. Yeah. And it, how, you know, like the towns that are in the Downing's Broadband, yeah. are the customers satisfied with the last few years of service? The only customers they've lost are the ones that have moved out of the area. <laughs> yeah. 
the ones that are dissatisfied are the ones that don't have it. Exactly. Or are waiting to get it. That's that's the they have very high customer satisfaction since their inception. Uh, Sedgwick. What were the other towns? Brooklyn and Sedgwick also looked at doing this kind of a model. Uh, but I think what happened is they, they paused that because there was an entire peninsula-wide project that was developed by Hancock County, I think in partnership with, with Consolidated Communications to put in Ethidium. So they ended up uh, shuttering their plans, but their network build cost was going to be roughly $12 million. A lot of that was going to be underground. Uh, yep, it, it was definitely going to be an expensive one. And they asked for close to a million, or was it $800,000 from Hancock County, I think, for their, their match. There was, it was quite a significant ask. And they were, they actually had their, uh, their interlocal or their, their, utility uh, already basically set up, but they abandoned that because it would have impacted the peninsula-wide project. So there are other cases of it being basically- if not, if, to sell this to the common folks in this area don't even come out for me. <laughs> You're here to help them. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, um, as much as I don't want to take on the responsibility of going door to door, <laughs> it is something that can be done. It's not necessarily the most efficient. Certainly, we've we've sent out mailings, and of course, we get some response. Uh, you know, we've got 138 responses to a survey. Uh, we got uh, now this probably brings us up into the 60s or 70s for people participating at outreach events. So we've gotten some response so far just through mailings and communicating that way. But uh, I think a lot of it's going to be more uh, more visibility and it's probably some hands on, especially if we're prioritizing underserved areas. Uh, it's going to probably be a lot of. My leg work is you need to sell the select public will follow. Well, and I think so far I can speak for because I have the most experience with the, the Gouldsboro Select Board. Uh, they seem very receptive to the proposal so far. And again, with the same with the same expectation that it's going to not increase taxes. Yeah. And if if we can make sure that the project fits that bill. I think we'll find they continue and to be supportive and the service will be good. The service and will be at least as good. it will be at least as good as the other utilities. <laughs> That's our expectation. It depends on how bad the whole mess is. Yeah. Um, have you, I mean, yeah, you know, we have an aging population. Mm -hmm. There's probably a lot of people who don't use computers, mm -hmm. don't even. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Have you considered going into the schools and talking to kids? They're the ones that want to play games. I they yeah. want it and they can sell it to their parents and grandparents. I think that would be a great idea. Um, I certainly the committee has looked to engage with the schools directly throughout this process. The problem is, and I admit uh, to being overly cautious in this because I am on the board. I don't like to, you know, throw any weight around and say, hey, I'd like to come in and do this presentation. That's to me not appropriate, but I'm certainly 100% uh, in support of uh, engaging with the schools to use them to, you know, distribute information to the extent that, is, that they will allow. Uh, and, and that's certainly you're right, this, the young people are going to be the drivers of this in a lot of cases. Young people and you know working age adults. Retirees, maybe not as much. Yeah. Yeah. Change is the best, just to keep up with yeah. Yeah. Everything I ever learned mm -hmm. about computers has been superseded so many times. Yeah. <laughs> but, and that's, that's another piece of it too. Uh, you know, we talk about cutting the cord. In, in a lot of ways, which means, you know, ditching your satellite television and your cable television and being able to do uh, pretty much everything over one single internet connection. 
And part of our work will be actually putting together information, selling points, if you will, talking points about how it can be easy and what it can look like to uh, financially if you want to cut the cord. So you're paying $150 a month for satellite. Well, what if you could pay $60 for internet and then pick 20 or $30 worth of services that you actually receive over that internet? You know, Because people on a fixed income are gonna be looking for ways to economize. And the trick is making it easy enough and straightforward and understandable so people can, can make that happen. Sandy? Uh, take that course, and there's some problem with speech and cutting the cord with NBC. That's a free course that's offered in our team that develops education. But these free courses are available. Oh, no. Um, we would encourage it. If you know other people that maybe are not as familiar and would like to work through that process to connect the LT adult education to find out this course. So we want to give other people to be and the education. I, I might lean on Andrew a little bit say, hey, have you got anything I can just put in like a one page thing that I can hand to somebody though? Uh, and just to, even if it's not to take away from people going and doing the course, but to spread that awareness. And courses with National Digital Equity Center, which is based out of Matthias, um, are all free courses. And there are several sites around the state that people can come in and view them live stream. Um, but people can also participate from the home and they can stream them. But they have a, a, an online course catalog as well as we have a paper catalog. And they have classes from I mean, use your Android or iPhone to keynote spell. So, and of course, now I've messed myself up here. Thank you very much. All right. So, thank you for coming out. And, uh, you know, we'll send out information if you signed up. And yeah, like, you got my email. All right. You've got like a All right. So it's very interesting. Well, thank you for coming. Appreciate you. And all your efforts. Is so Do what we can. Yeah. It doesn't make us a lot of difference to me. I just came because I was doing this. Now I know I want to. And curiosity is the starting point. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Thanks for it. Thank you. Thank you, people on Zoom. Hopefully that was informative. And if you have any questions, uh, put your your email address in the chat, and we can maybe have a longer discussion that way. I'll leave this open for a couple minutes if you want to do that. Thank you. You're very good in what you do. You got that great question. You really have to take a question. No, I don't think there's any questions. I'm not looking longer than the answer. They were all very well. Thank you.